And I thought, wow, it's real. The whole God and Bible, Jesus, it's real that we do live on. Hello, and welcome to Spirit Travels, where we narrate the extraordinary experiences of people who have glimpsed the other side of death. My name is Maureen, and I will be your narrator on this journey. If you enjoy this content, please make sure to like and subscribe to support our channel. Now let's begin. Hi everyone, welcome back to Spirit Travels. I'm Maureen and this week we have Peggy here as our guest, our special guest, and she has some incredible accounts, plural, uh, to share with us today. So I'm going to let her uh, go ahead and Take it away, Peggy. I'm Peggy Robinson, and um, I was born and raised in Marietta, Ohio. And um, when I was five years old, I always remember this memory. It just starts a certain way and ends a certain way. It's so strange how memories are. It's just like it's cut out this time that's just like stamped in your head, which I didn't even re recall it till after my second NDE 20 years later. But now that's fully, you know, memory is just strange because I remember it sitting there on the floor playing with my Barbie dolls in my bedroom. And my mom walks in and I just see her so clear. She throws this dish towel over her shoulder and she's this hot outside. Let's go swimming. And she says, you and John go on ahead and me and Terry will be down after a bit. John and Terry's my siblings and I'm the youngest of five kids. The other, the two oldest weren't home that day and Nora was my dad. And so John and I got our swimsuits on. We rush out the back door of the house and we go running down the hill to the pond. And it's called Catfish Paradise now. It's an actual popular fishing spot. But back then, I don't know if anybody used it, but our family. And so John ran on ahead and not pay attention to me, just thinking about what he wanted to do. And he runs down to the farthest end of the pond, dove in and was doing laps from center and back. And... I was just a five, so I just, and I couldn't swim. I could just dog paddle a little bit. So I always knew where to go. We went down with mom and dad, this certain place along the side, the highway side of the pond. And we knew it was shallow there, but you still had to use your feet to move around and make sure you didn't slip into any drop-offs and get in over your head. So I'm just moving my feet around and I'm really wanting to get in the water, but I know I have to wait till my mom's there so I'm watching for her and my sister to come and they're not coming anytime soon because I don't see them so you kind of bored and I see John having fun doing these laps and I see a board floating along the water and I thought I could use that as a raft and I could do what John's doing I could go to center and back doing laps if I use this board so that's what I did and it worked perfect I put my little belly across the board and I went dog paddling out and once I got out there, I said, hey, John, look at me. Like, you know, I'm doing the same thing you are. He swims out real fast, grabs the board, turns around and starts doing his laps on it. And I in the center of the pond and I can't swim. And I don't even know how to tread water really or float or anything. And so the water is like this and I'm able to keep my head up a little bit. And then I can't keep it up any longer and I'm underneath the water and it's muddy water and I'm tumbling down and I'm screaming underwater and I lose direction of what's up down sideways because it's so muddy. And I thought, oh my gosh, I got to stop and think what to do. And I was screaming under the water and I was so scared and it hurt so bad. And all of a sudden I'm at the ceiling in our house looking down at my mom and my sister getting stuff out of the cabinets. I couldn't hear anything like earthly, like them open the cabinets or talking, but I felt their emotions. I could feel their deep concentration, the quietness of their thoughts as they were deciding what to bring down. And then suddenly I'm back in the water. And I believe um, my mind took me to where they were because as I was choking underwater, I was thinking, you know, where are they? Like I looked at my mom, my sister, Terry, as my protectors. I have an older sister, but she's mentally disabled. She was never like a caretaker. I was more a caretaker of her. And so I looked at them as my caretakers and I'm thinking, I wish they were here to save me. And then that's when I was at the ceiling. So now I'm back in the water and my throat is hurting 
more than I can handle. It feels like it's going to burst wide open. And then I wake up and I had that real calm feeling like you have when you wake up from a nap. And uh, I thought my parents lied to me because here I am, I'm breathing fine, I think. And I thought, why did they lie to us and, you know, scare me like that and and thinking that we can't breathe underwater because I am breathing, everything's fine. And I drift down to the bottom and the fish are bumping into me. And when they do, my body just sways. And I realize, you know, how come they're not afraid of me? And I'm fascinated as I see their mouth and their fins and their tails go right in front of my face. And a vision opens up, this little scenario, but it's like I, it's a memory, but I'm now like inside that memory. And the memory is in my living room at our house. And I'm at my face at the fishbowl looking in. And I'm wondering how come the fish aren't afraid of the treasure chest mom put in there, but they're afraid of my hand I put it in. And then it, like this knowledge come, this comparison that gave me the wisdom to know, oh, the fish know something I don't. They know the difference between alive and dead. And I'm dead. And I thought, huh, well, I don't want to be a dead girl bomb this pond. And I th th saw a future scenario where my family would drive by the pond when they're way in and out of going to town and they'd say that's where peg is they point to the pond i thought i would always be this dead girl bomb this pond like they'd never find me and i thought huh well i don't want to be a dead girl bomb this pond and i started to lift up and i got to the edge of the water and i could see below the water and above just the same it's like i could see two views at once now this is strange i noticed my vision's different and I noticed my hearing's different because I don't hear the birds, the highway, anything. All I hear is my inner thoughts that are so clear. And then I get start to go up and I'm thinking, I'm a little, I'm afraid of heights. I don't want to go too high. And I then I think, well, that's silly because I'm dead. I don't have a body. I don't see me at all. I don't see my body again at all. It's down at the bottom of that pond. And I, anything I knew about being a ghost was watching cartoon Casper Friendly Ghost. I didn't know anything about this. And so I got to straight above Mill Pond as high as the treetops. And I thought, well, that's high enough for now. I can go farther later. I'm just getting used to this. So I'm going to take it slow. And so I'm looking around and I think it's so cool to see up high because it's like you're in a helicopter ride, which we can never afford at the fair, the helicopter rides. I always want to go up and see things, you know, from below. And, and here I am, like I'm hovering. Now, this is really cool. I can see clear up the hilltop. I can see both ends of the train tracks and the highway going all the way down. I can see clear across the highway over to the high river. And I look down to where I'd always walked in and out to the pond to go fishing or swimming with my family and thinking how my view was always just as high as I was. That's all I ever got. And so I was really feeling I had this um, nice advantage. And I thought, well, since I can hover, I suppose I could fly. And I'm looking around which way to go. I could go right towards Belpre or left towards Marietta. We did it at Constitution, Ohio's country in between those two towns. And as I'm thinking, which way should I go? I heard a female voice a certain distance from me that I could tell where she physically was, even though I don't see her. And it's like a young adult female voice. And she says, no, don't. If they find you soon, you might go back. I thought, go back. That's not how death works. And you just don't go back. I thought this woman don't know anything about death. And so I thought, well, I'll be good for a while, I guess. But you know, I thought, you know, I don't have to listen to anybody anymore. I don't have to listen to adults. Um, I don't have to go in at dark. I don't have to, you know, go to bed or eat my vegetables. And I'm going to go have fun. I'm going to try to find some kids to play with. I thought, kids die too. You know, I just did. So there's got to be kids somewhere. And so I went right towards Belpre. And there's a two-story old white house. And I approached the door, and when I approached the door, I just saw right inside, like there was no door, and there was old people sitting around a table. 
and they all had white hair and they're talking all serious adult stuff and um back it was 1966 back then kids didn't speak you know without being asked to you know you didn't interrupt adults so i kind of stood there shy for a minute and they all turned to look at me and the man at the end of the table spoke and said like can i help you and i said where can i find kids to play with i was kind of shy to ask and he said try the graveyards in marietta and i huh never thought of that you know so i went on back towards the pond which is towards marietta but I veered off from the pond and along Route 7, the highway, it goes to Marietta. I come along two boys that are walking, one shorter and taller, and they're carrying fishing poles and buckets. And um, so I start walking along beside them. Hey, what are you doing? Where are you going? What are you doing? What's, what's up? You know, and they're ignoring me. And I thought, huh, they ignore me just like my older siblings do. And so um, then I started telepathically talking to the younger one. He started answering me. Oh, we've been fishing. We're hurrying home. And. And I thought, oh, okay, he's talking to me. But I realized it was just through our minds that he was kind of like in back of his mind. Like he, he didn't really know I was there. And I thought, well, this ain't so fun. So I flew on down the highway, over top the highway, and come to a billboard. And I veered off. And I went down. It's called West Side of Marietta. It's like the poor side. It's where my grandparents lived. And as I dipped down, I went down a street. And there on the corner across my aunt's house, was this poor family of kids all running playing ball kickball so i run in and i'm playing kickball and i'm running having fun i thought i found kids to play with i realized they don't know i'm here they don't see me so i'll do something else so um we went trick-or-treating we were so poor that I, whenever we go to these nice houses i would because everybody's house was better than ours and i would peek in the entryways i love to look at the beautiful staircases and entryways and so I thought, I'll go look at these houses, see what they look like inside. Like I always wanted to as trick or treat. So I went on through these houses and it's strange because I have the memory of doing those things. But at the same time, I've always said in my mind, but I know I never left the center of the pond. She told me don't go yet. Uh, if they find you soon, you, you might go back. I didn't think about going back. I didn't think that was true. But, you know, part of me like stayed there. Because this other stuff happened too. And so I don't know if we can be, you know, more places than one, or if I just had these experiences and part of me stayed, I don't know. But part of me stayed there. And as I'm hovering above the pond and I'm watching for my mom, sister to come and they're not there. And, and my brother's down there on the board. And, um, I'm having these, um, this, this download comes. My family doesn't love me. Oh, I didn't know that. I mean, I knew my siblings, I was a pain in the butt, and my little sister was disabled. She just, you know, really, I was our, her caretaker. She didn't know how to take care of anybody. And, um, but she was nice. But, and I knew my dad didn't like me, but I always thought my mom loved me. So I thought that I pondered on that for a little bit. And then a voice said audibly in my head, very clear, a male voice said, children are sent here to be loved. That is why God sends them here. I, well, that's not fair. You tell me my family don't love me, and then you tell me this. Well, that's not right. Like, where's the justice in that? And so at some point, I notice my mom and my sister are sitting now on the bed sheet, and they're at the pond. And I look down, and I feel their conversation. I don't hear what they're saying, but I can tell it's very intimate, close female. And I felt jealous because I knew I died and I would never be old enough to be able to talk to my mom like that, to have that kind of older conversation. And then I looked over to my left and there's my brother still doing my laps. And I feel anger that he you know, caused me to die. He didn't need that board. And I did. And I drowned without it. And he wouldn't even care. And so um at some point, I don't know if it's going through the houses or, or thinking that because it seemed to all happen at once. Um, there's not like a sequence of time that's real clear. Um, because at first I remembered just that. And then the other part of going to the house and going down the highway stuff come later in bits and pieces. So at some point I wake up and I'm being carried over my brother's right shoulder. He's carrying my dead body. 
and I see the pavement, the gray pavement of the ground of the road. And I see my mom as I'm dangling upside down and my sister up ahead walking to, on his right back up to the house. And they're real quiet. And I start throwing up water down my brother's back. And he goes, Mom, can I put her down now? Because I'm, you know, little sister's throwing up on him. And she, Terry and her, my mom, both turn and look at the same time. And she, my mom went, sigh of relief and turn right around and her and Terry are whispering and I still felt that communication I felt their emotions still even though I'm alive I, I felt just like, like I did when I was dead I was tapping into what's going on with them it was like they were best friends like mom was a child herself and mom's worried she's going to get in trouble with my dad for this happening and it's like secretive talk and they walk on up the head to the house and like they didn't want to acknowledge this just happened. And so my brother sets me down on the road on my feet and he runs up to the house after them. And so I'm standing there so sick and my belly's full as palm water and I'm weak. And I have all this knowledge of what it's like to go flying down the highway to run around playing with kids as a ghost. And this knowledge of my family don't love me. And I look up at my house and I'm thinking, why would I go up to that house to a family don't love me? That doesn't make any sense. And I thought, I want to go back to the pond and go, I don't hurt, but I'm not going to fight it this time. I want to go back to what I was doing. And I thought it'll be a mystery. Like what happened to her? She was fine. And now she's drowned again, like, or missing or whatever. I didn't know. And I felt like it was my right somehow. At five years old, I felt like I had a right. If I didn't want to live in a house and people didn't love me, that I would have a right to go back to what I was doing. And as I took a couple steps towards the pond to do that, I heard the female voice again. But now I see this white image of a young woman in a flowing white gown very like faint but it's hovering over the road and she says no don't and i knew it was the same voice i heard before it says no don't go yet if they find you soon you might go back i knew that was her voice but i see this image with it now and she says no don't i said why not you know they don't love me and she goes well you'll have a lot of love someday i said where will i find it and she pointed right towards belbury so i went on home and i as I'm walking home up the hill to the house and I walk in the house, I don't hear nobody. I don't see nobody. Nobody's rushing. Like, thank God you're okay. Or, I don't know where they were. And I don't know if there's a kitchen whispering and talking, coming up the plane to keep it a secret. I don't know where they were. I didn't see them. And so I went to, I got in out of my night or my swimsuit, got on my nightgown, crawled in bed, covered up, picked up a nursery rhyme book. A woman that lives in a shoe and I flipped through and when I got to the page had all these um, beds lined up I thought I wonder if that's what the angel meant she said I'd have a lot of love someday I wonder if she meant I'd have a lot of children maybe I'd have orphans maybe I would love unloved children like me and but I just kind of knew that I was on my own from now on that I would have to be my own mother and watch out for myself that I learned something about my family, that they really didn't care about me. And so that was the drowning NDE. And some weird things happened after that, that come to me after I remembered it, um, started popping in my head. And I thought, oh, I had these memories all through my life, but I would just dismiss them. Like, well, that's weird. What was I thinking about that for? Like, but it keep coming up like it was a memory. So what I remember is, um, I got up one night, everybody was in bed, and I was in my, still five years old, so like not long after the drowning, and I knock on the bathroom door because I got to go pee, and my dad is sitting on the toilet with a newspaper, and he gets so mad that I'm knocking on the door and say, I got to pee, makes him so mad, he slams the newspaper shut, Now, mind you, my dad never liked me, I think he hated me, actually, and because my mom spoiled me because I was the youngest, and he, his favorite was the middle child, Terry, the tomboy. And he slammed that paper so loud, I jumped. And that was it. Like, 
what's, what's up with that memory? Well, then later more of that memory continued that after I, um, dad walked out of the bathroom, he says, now go in there and sit down and don't get up and till morning. And you're not going to tell your mother either. And I went and sat down on the toilet and I sat there all night looking at every, the ceiling tile, the, the dippity doo jar. I mean, everything was sitting there. And I finally, my butt was getting so sore from sitting on the toilet. I was using my hands to hold my body up and I, there's a little window over top the, where the toilet was. And I thought, I wish I could go out there and um, go flying. And what would I do if I was flying? And next thing I know, I see an image of this little ghost going shimmying up the wall, which was such a strange memory to have. And on his little elbows and knees and go out that window and I'm still sitting there and I'm thinking, Oh no, I went out there. I'm going to get in trouble. The neighbors are going to come over and say, I was playing with that girl next door's toys. You know, these things are going through my head. And I said, well, maybe I'm out there, you know, um, catching lightning bugs or I don't know what I'm doing out there. And I thought I'm going to get in trouble. And I thought, no, somebody would say they see me out there. Mom would come in and see I'm sitting here. So how can I be out there? It was very confusing. It's still confusing. It's like, I don't know. Like it's, it's maybe this, I felt like it was a boy, like his boy spirit got in me. And then, and then what, I don't, I don't know. It was very strange. I have no answers. And then another strange thing is I woke up from a nap right after the drowning and the other kids were at school and my mom was in the kitchen. I got up out of the nap eventually and went and found her. But when I woke up, there was three people standing along the bed looking down at me and I didn't know if they were ghosts, if they were real, but they looked just like real people, but they were dressed like, um, little house and prairie days, the long dresses, the, the bibs or the uh, apron and the man had the bibs and kind of poor looking. It was a tall man in the center and then a female on each side, one older one or younger one, like maybe a teenager and that women had their hair pulled back. And I was like, go away, go away. And I closed my eyes and I look and they're still there. And I was like, go away. I said, I'm going to open my eyes again until you're gone. And eventually they were gone. But it was so scary the way they, they were looking down at me like they knew me. And I'm like, I don't know these people. And like pe people would stand at a casket when they're saying their goodbyes, how you know they stand there and they look down that sad face. That's how they were looking at me. I'm thinking, I'm not an old lady. I'm not dead. You don't know me. So finally, when they were gone, I ran the kitchen and I found my mom and I said, who was those people in my room? And she was like, there was nobody in there, nobody here but us. And so that was a mystery. And then the third strange thing that happened after my drowning is I went to my pre-Sunday school class and the teacher said, get a coloring page out of the closet and sit down color. And when I went to do that, something come over me, this excitement. Like I was meant to find one certain page. It was meant just for me. And I started going through the papers real quick and I pulled one out. I was like, that's it. That's the one. That's the one. And I went and sat down and started coloring. And it was a picture of Jesus sitting on a big rock, a small child on his lap and two middle-sized children, one shorter and taller on the side. And he's looking out front of this picture I'm coloring as I'm coloring I'm singing Jesus loves me over and over and louder and louder it's like I'm going to some kind of trance and I hear the word manifest now and I'm not sure I really understand that concept but I think is that what happened because as I'm coloring and singing and I'm so excited about Jesus and the children but suddenly I am now standing in heaven and that exact scene is there. Jesus is sitting on this big rock and here's these two kids by the side. It's kind of like the memory of the goldfish bowl. Now that I think about it, I never made a connection before. It's like this scene just appears and it's alive. And um, I'm standing there in front of Jesus and just exactly as this picture shows, but it's, it's live happening and I look at him and I want to push that kid off his lap because I want to sit on his lap so bad. I could feel Jesus' love for the children and I wanted to feel his love for me. And so I'm just standing there like, oh, I want to push her off his lap. 
so bad. Like waiting in line to see Santa Claus. You can't wait your turn. And I'm just standing there and Jesus looks at me and smiles. And he's looking at me like, you ordinary little thing. <laughs> you know? Like I'm trying so hard to be good, but it's hard. And, and I'm just standing there and I'm feeling Jesus' love for the children and his, his love and, and um, the way he was looking at me. And then I hear a voice say, Jesus loves children of every color. Never forget that. And so those are just like three strange things. Oh, the other strange thing, I guess there was four, is after the drowning, not long after that, we went up the road, Vito Lake, to go fishing, where we would normally go with our family. And we got out of the car, and we're, everybody's setting up their fishing poles, and I thought, I'm bored with fishing. I know more now about fish than I care to because of the drowning. And... So I started to wander off and I started feeling led, like something saying, come over here, come over here. And I uh, hear my mom yell for my brother, John. And I look back and she cups her hand and she says, go with her. She didn't want my dad to see that she was for some reason want him to watch me. And so John catches up with me and he, and then my sister, Terry, the tomboy comes and she says, what's going on? And John says, it's not my fault. She drowned. She, he said, I get in trouble for everything she does. And Terry says, well, forget about that. Come go with me. And they went another direction. And so I continue going. And here on the left is this beautiful lake and these pretty trees and grass and stuff. And I want to go over there. But something's pushing. Tell me, no, don't go over there. Go over here on the right. And I stood there like, ew, it's ugly. I don't want to go in there. It was um, dry cracked mud and leaves, dead leaves and sticks. And it was really gross. And I'm like, I don't want to go in there. And it's like, come in here. So I went over there and I was like, why am I here? This is just like void of life. And then I saw one flower growing and it grew out from under a rock. And I sat down, I say, I'm five years old. And so I sit down and I'm like, how did you grow here? You're like you're so beautiful and how'd you grow out from under these this rock and since there's nothing else no life here but you and then i started getting these visions it was communicating i think it was the the angel that when i drowned i think she wanted to continue communicating this how she got my attention and did it because now these visions are open up this vision opens up and i see my girlfriends, my friends at Sunday school who have the long hair and the bows and the beautiful dresses and the lacy white socks and black shiny shoes. And here's me in this ugly short pixie haircut all chopped up and my poor hand-me-down clothes from my chubby sister hand-me-down to me is too big. And, um, and I see this comparison and then I see a vision open up of my mom and her two sisters and my grandma. And they're all talking about what is their favorite flower. And it seemed like they were trying to impress each other by naming this expensive flower. Someone says, well, that could only be grown at a, a flower shop. Like, you know, they're trying to put on airs. And then they showed me that comparison. And then it showed me, I guess, like how girls are envious of each other as children and as women. And it said, those girls in my Sunday school, says they're like those fancy flower shop flowers. They need a lot of special care to survive. But you are like this wildflower that was growing out from underneath the rock. And you're going to have a, you're going to grow up in a harsh environment like this wildflower. But because of it, you're going to have a long road to go. But because of it, you're going to have a strength inside of you that those girls will never know. You will have the will of a wildflower. And that's when I wrote my book when I was 55. Just come on me one day. Talk, everything come together. And I knew that's the only title I could have for my book is the will of a wildflower. And so that was it for the drowning, the, the memories after. And then 20 years later, I'm uh, 25 years old. And I have two little boys, they're uh, four and five. I have um, my nephew, see they're five and six and my nephew's four. And um, we're adopting him. He's uh, in the process of adopting him. He's my oldest sister, disabled one, uh, biological son. And so I have three little boys and I'm praying for twins and it's Easter Sunday and life is perfect. I did have a very hard time growing up. And so I'm standing there 
and we're on the property that we uh, had just bought and we're um, my husband and I are discussing where to put the house and the rooms and how this is going to set and etc and the our little three little boys are down in the woods playing and we lived in town and so I'm telling myself let them go we gotta you know let them play and we I grew up playing in the woods and stuff with my siblings it was a real small age we go off and I, I have to learn to let it go a little bit I can hear them and all of a sudden we hear my oldest son Matthew yell mom cheer me and my husband took off running to find out what was wrong and I was frozen in fear and I instantly started praying. I said, God, I need to be there right now. Not the time it takes my feet to get me there. Please don't let my son die. I was scared to death. What happened to him for my son, Matthew, to yell like that. And so I started praying, God, please, you know, save my son, Jeremy, whatever's going on. And I'm just praying, praying. And all of a sudden it's like I left my body and I was like in this space like I was above the pond in a drowning even though as all my property it was i was in this like out of my body in this i call it like now like i don't know how else to call it but like land of knowing where you get this knowledge and i got this knowledge that even though our creek you know, every time we've been there you look at the property and bought it and it was always ankle deep but what this knowledge was letting me know is we've had a lot of rain and melting snow and parts of that creek was swift and Jeremy had fell in and he was trying to swim instead of it was not that deep. He could stand up and get out of there. So instantly I started praying to Jeremy in that prayer without even thinking about it. It's like Jeremy, I switched from praying to God to Jeremy. I said, Jeremy, calm down, stand up. It's not that deep. Walk out of there. And then as I'm walking down, I start praying. I said, like, God, if you have to take one of my children today, take my twins. I love them. I want them, but I couldn't live one day without seeing my baby Jeremy's face. And so I'm standing there just scared to death. And I see my husband jumping down different places to Creek looking for him. And then he comes across where he sees him. Cause I see him stop. I just see him behind stop. And then I see my little boy, Jeremy's dark brown hair come by the Creek and his big blue eyes. He didn't even glance at his dad. He looked like in a trance straight towards me and he walked up to me and I'm just scared. I'm thinking, am I seeing his ghost? Like, is he okay? And because I was so sure he was dead and I'm going to have to deal with it, you know, a funeral and my dead child and I'm not going to survive this. And, and Jeremy's just standing there, looks up and he says, mom, was you worried about me? And I dropped to my knees and I hug him. I say, here, my baby, Jeremy. So that was 1986, a week before the second end of Eve for the epitopic pregnancy. I'm sorry. I need to go to when Jeremy was 20. We was at uh, Jeremy's apartment with his girlfriend and uh, a um, New Year's Eve party. And I'm telling that story for the first time about I was so scared and, and I was praying. Jeremy you know, Matthew yelled, I was sure he was drowning, he was dead or something. And Jeremy heard me in the kitchen and he steps out and he says, mom, I heard you pray. And everybody at the house looked at him like, what are we talking about? He says, I heard you praying. He says, when I was drowning, I heard you praying. He said, you told me to stand up, calm down. It's not that deep walk out of there. And he says, that's what it was. He said, I fell in and I was panicking and I, we had never discussed this. And so I thought, so that was a real thing. Like, I didn't know you heard my prayer. So it gave some valid, validated some of my memories. And, and, and I could have never imagined that happening. That was just like this horrible memory I never would have talked about. So back in 1986, after Easter Sunday, I started having pain. And I called my doctor and I said, I think it's a tool pregnancy. He says, nope, I did ultrasound when you were in my office. Both babies are in the uterus. I was two months pregnant. I was starting to show. That was a tiny little thing. And um, a couple of days later, I can't hurry to get off the couch. The pain's so bad. I called my doctor and he says, everything's fine. By Friday, I couldn't walk. The pain was so bad. And then I started bleeding. So I had my husband take the kids down and have dinner with his mom because I couldn't get up and make dinner. And while they were down there, I called and I said, I need to go to the hospital. Leave the kids with your mom. Come get me. So on the way, the hospital was our way where we lived at in Tupper's Plains to Marietta we got almost to the hospital a few miles away and all of a sudden my pain left me in such a strange way that I knew I was dying and I said a prayer to God don't let me die right now just 
wait a few minutes till I get to the hospital. Because if I die right now in this car, my husband's going to pull over. He's going to be freaking out. He's going to be alone out here. I picture cars pulling over and he'd be upset. I always get this future, like premonition memories. And uh, at this time, I just thought, I'm just dead here. Just just let me wait till the hospital. So we pull in the hospital. We go in and I say, I don't know if it's to a pregnancy. I said, but I feel like I'm going to throw up or pass out. So they had him stay and sign papers. They put me in a wheelchair. And just as we started to go down this long hall to find a room, they had put a blue bowl in my lap because I got sick. And just as they started to push me, I thought, oh, I'm going to throw up. And I wanted to lift my hands off the armrest of the wheelchair and get that bowl and hold it so I could vomit. But I lost contact with my body. I couldn't lift a finger. I couldn't lift my hands. I couldn't tell my body what to do. It was like I was paralyzed. And I thought, I lost contact with my body. Oh, wait a minute. I'm not going to throw up. After all, I'm going to pass out. I'm going to pass out right now. And I'm very familiar with passing out because I have irritable bowel. And at one point, my stress was so bad that two, three times a week I was passing out. And you just wake up and, you know, there's no memories or dreams or anything. So I thought I was going to pass out. When I passed out, I felt my chin hit my chest. And all of a sudden, I'm in a tunnel, and there's this vibration and this wind speed, and I'm shot like a rocket way up through space. And I start looking around. I'm thinking, i got to get back to my boys. How can I run away? How can I get out of here? And this vibration, and it felt like we were going through galaxy and galaxy. And then then every now and then, there was like this knock. And I thought, we're going through another dimension or galaxy. Something is giving this feeling of going so far away in space, away from Earth. And suddenly, I'm everything is the opposite of the loud, bumpy, noise speed ride. I am suspended in bright white light. Everything's perfectly quiet and still. And I look down and I feel just like me, but there's no body at all. And, but I feel like I have everything. And I'm looking around. I notice I see 360, but everything is white. The If it was a room, it would be the floor the walls, the ceiling, but also in the middle was white. Like I was contained in this light and I'm just hovering in it. And I'm thinking, well, this must be heaven. What else would it be? But where is everybody? Did I do something wrong? I want to be alone for eternity. And, and I thought, wow, it's real. The whole God and Bible, Jesus, it's real that we do live on. You know, I was scared to death because the scary movies I'd see, a scene a teenager as a teenager that you're in this coffin and you're scratching to get out and all these awful things nightmares you think of death and this isn't what i heard about in sunday school uh and you know church we were told that at the end of times everybody goes together like everybody's lifted out of the grave but here i was and I, wow it's all true like you know there's heaven and I say, I said to myself, like, if you were praying to God, just like sitting there, like talking to him, because I don't see anybody, but I'm saying, God, you need to send people back. You need to let people know this is real. Maybe if you sent some back, people would believe it because now everybody's reading the Bible. It's getting outdated. I mean, that's what I said about the Bible. And I was like, you know, not everybody can read it or wants to read it or knows about. And if you sent people back and let them know it's real. And then I seen a panel of people on my right, just a faint outline. And I'm squinting because I feel like I still have eyes. And I'm squinting. And I'm like, who's there? And all I could see was this faint outline. I could see the shoulder and the head going up the arms. And I see it's a panel of people because they're standing side by side, real stiff, like a jury. And then I'm scanning, squinting. And I see another row of people sitting up front of that. And my eyes go back and I focus on the one sitting up front and center, which all is just out, faint outlines. And I think for sitting up front and center, I'm in heaven. That has to be God. And I started yelling at him like, hell no, I won't go. You can't make me. I have kids to raise and I'm throwing a huge fit. Like they're like, I, when I see him, I feel like I have a complaint department. Somebody I can complain to and say, excuse me, stay here. And Then the seat opens up on my left and this as if you just walked into a grocery store and the woman at the checkout's there and there's this little dark haired boy 
and he's thrown a fit, but he wants something. He wants it right now. And he's like, ah, he's those big fit. And I could tell there's a mom and, and maybe it seems like a faint um, feeling that there's a man standing there too, but quiet. And the mom is telling the child, no, you can't have that. And she was unaffected by his fit. And God's voice come to me audible, but um, I guess telepathic because it's in my head. And I hear his voice and it's a strong, firm, authoritative, but loving voice. And it lets me know the answer is no. It is my time that I'm not going back. And I believe that scenario was God's way of letting me know this is how you're acting. You're acting like a spoiled child. I need to calm down. And I thought, well, I'm going to try something else. So I said, God, I know from being Catholic, you're omniscient. You can see into the future. If you see that my sons would be better off without me for whatever reason, I agree to stay. But if not, I beg to return. And then I see I'm still this invisible, like I would say, an orb, like just this invisible, but I feel just like me. I see a cross from me, a physical me. And it's like I, I don't know, it's just like it just appeared. And I'm watching because I realize after every time I remember, and it's the same exact way, that I am across, seeing myself across the room. It's not like I'm right here. I see myself across the room doing this. And I'm over there and I'm screaming out to God. And I guess you might call it a life review, but it's me showing God my life. They're not showing me, I'm showing them. And I'm burning out every abuse I ever went through, like it's grocery list, and let God know I cannot have one thing that happened to me happen to my kids. I was scared to death that my mom would have custody of my kids or that my ex wouldn't watch them because he drinks more than he should. And, you know, I took care of the kids. Um, his parents weren't a good option either. And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't grasp not take care of my children. And so I said, if, you, if they would be better off, then I agree to stay. And then I see a man from behind and dark wavy brown hair, shoulder length. And all I just see from back of the head, it didn't move. And I knew that must be Jesus. And I just swooped over right beside him. I didn't look at him, you know, to see what it looked like or anything. As soon as I joined beside, we dipped down and suddenly we're over my trailer and um, all of a sudden it's at night. And then the roof is like disappear. We can see and we drop down closer to hear what the boys are saying. And it's my three boys in their bedroom discussing the fact that mom has died. So this was in the future if I didn't return. And my son, Jeremy, says to his older brother, Matthew, he says, I don't care if you say mom is dead. I want her back, and I want her back right now. And I felt his pain so bad, I retracted. And now I'm in the bright white light again, but now I am a physical me standing in front of this panel. And there's still just an outline, but I'm closer. I'm right in front of them. And I had been blaming God for my death. And now I took full responsibility. My ex made me get my tubes tied when I was 20. I got them reversed when I was 25. I knew there was a slight chance of tool pregnancy if I got that surgery and had a tool pregnancy. And it killed the twins. It killed me, which caused my sons to be raised motherless. And I was sobbing like I never sobbed in my life. The regret that I did this. This was my fault, not God's fault. And then I think, okay, uh, I'll, I'll wait here till my sons are old men and they die. And then I'll get to see them again someday. I'll wait here for them. And then this huge wave of fear come on me. What if my sons hate God? Because I've heard of that. Of when kids lose their mom at a young age, sometimes they hate God. What if they never come to heaven? What if I never see him again? And I am back sobbing. And now I am crumbled. I am sobbing so much. I'm crumbled at the floor of heaven, heaven in front of God, but more in front of Jesus. And I see my hands come up in front of my face. And as I try to look up at Jesus, but all I see is the feet. And I believe the bottom of his gown. And if I imagine that, I don't know. I pictured it, but that's where I feel I'm at, at, at Jesus' feet. 
and I try to look up to him. I don't see anything, but all I see is my hands from my face. And I say, who else will teach them about you? And then I'm back in that wheelchair. Now, there's a slight second that I usually don't talk about between that moment of saying, who else will teach them about you? I'm at the fluorescent light of the hall in the emergency room, and I see my long brown hair slumped over in the wheelchair and two nurses standing behind me, standing there facing each other, talking. And something's saying, like, get in there, get in there. I get in my body. I'm like, I don't know how. It's like, just go, just go. And it's such a small little split second and I didn't talk about it for the longest time um, because my story was always that I'm right back in that wheelchair because that's the biggest impact because now I'm back and I'm thinking what the hell was that I was just in heaven accepting it and now I'm back but I felt like I had just a short amount of time to save myself like God's given me a little bit a few more minutes to see if my doctor can help me. My doctor happened to be on call. He examined me. He says, Peggy, why do you keep saying it's to a pregnancy? I told you both babies are in the uterus. You're fine. Your uterus is still intact. Pregnancy's fine. You're fine. I couldn't tell him what just happened. I was afraid they put me in a psych ward. And having a sister that's mentally ill and seeing her in and out of mental institutions um, prior, my ex, his family, wanting my ex to divorce me and take their children. It's like, I couldn't say a word. But I was not going home because I knew if I did, my sons would find me dead. If I'm going to die, I'm going to die here in a hospital and they'll get a phone call because I'm not going to do that to him. So I said, I'm not going home. And he looked at my husband like, what's wrong with her? And my husband was like, oh, no. He said, well, make you feel better since you live our way. You can spend the night. And he just kind of looked at me strange and they left. Put me in a private room. All night I'd wake up with this pain in my right hip bone. I'd sit up and it was like really painful. And I get, I feel sick and I get my bowl and I wake up and I, when I wake up, I'm covered with vomit everywhere except my bowl. And after a few times, my nurse is getting mad. Use your bowl. I was like, I think I'm passing out. Like I wouldn't throw up on myself on purpose. And then after so many times, I said, call the doctor. There's something wrong. She said, no, I'm not calling the doctor. He's home asleep. And I'm sure she put on the chart. There's nothing wrong with her. We don't know why she wants to spend the night in the hospital. And after so many times waking up, I started realizing I was dying each time and uh, no more into ease. But I remember thinking, God, I know you can't keep sending me back. Please keep me awake till more awake, alive till morning. Maybe the doctor will come in early, do an ultrasound. If it's not too, but what is it? He'll find out what's wrong because I was just dead in heaven. I couldn't deny that. I knew it. And now the pain is back and stuff. Because when I first come back in the wheelchair after heaven, I had no pain. I had no nausea. I had no symptoms of anything. And so now all this stuff is coming back and, I, and the doctor's not there. And so morning, they take me down to ultrasound. Luckily, the doctor had come in and ordered one. I'm sure it was to prove me wrong that I was fine. But they were noticing when they set me up, take me down. I passed out and they had to take me flat in my bed because every time I sat up, I passed out. So they were getting the inkling here, something's wrong. So they did the ultrasound. And the doctor said, you have internal bleeding feeling, filling your entire abdominal cavity clear up to your chest. So it was a tubal pregnancy. One baby's in the uterus, one was in the tube, but it was half in and half out. And that's why I didn't show up on the ultrasound. And so they put me upstairs to sign away all my organs. They called my family and said, she's not going to make it. And then finally they took me into surgery. And then um, obviously everything was fine. But of course, the babies didn't make it. I was two months pregnant. And. So that was the two, the second NDE, and strange things start happening after that. Uh, we were at a family reunion, and uh, I was pregnant again. It was just a couple of months after I lost the twins. I was a couple of months pregnant, and I was just one one baby this time, not twins. And um, everybody's in line for the food, and I hear a baby cry. And I ask my husband, do you hear a baby cry? And he's like, no. And I kept going up the line asking people, no. And they just kept looking at the food. Nobody cared that maybe a baby's crying somewhere. And so I just kept following the sound of this baby crying. And I ended up in this field. And I looked around, and I didn't hear anymore. But I felt that lead feeling that I can connect now, I couldn't then, to when I was led to the wildflower that day at Vito Lake. My family went fishing. I was led like over here and something was starting to lead me 
and I felt kind of not in another dimension, but kind of like in a, uh, I don't know, your vision gets, or your, your hearing gets different. You start to like hear inside, is that outside? And a voice said, go over that patch of grass. And I thought, there's nothing over there. So I walked over and here is a little toddler, a little boy face down, barely twitching. He had drowned in that creek. There's a creek in his tall grass. And my ex later said, well, he went investigated it. He's like, why is this here? And he said they were getting water into the cabins up on the hill at this park. And so they had cut out this deep creek for this spring to run through. And and that's where he must have fell in because he's just barely twitching. And I picked him up back of the shirt and stood him up on his feet. And he looked at me and this water's just flooding on his eyes and his nose and mouth and, and his face. And he's looking up at me. With like he's shock on his face, looking at me like, what? why is he looking at me like that? And he takes off running and he's talking to his parents. And I look over and there he's pointing at me. And they're like, what, what? Like they don't see me or something. And like, he's pointing at me and like, what? I'm like I'm standing right here. So I could tell when I picked him up at that moment, I miscarried. So we just, I got something to eat and left. And so later was at his family's house. And there's, Always have a big Catholic family, 12 kids, always have these parties and these reunions and stuff. And nobody could say, I'm sorry, you lost the twins. Nobody could say, I'm sorry, you lost another baby right after that. Nobody could ever show me one bit of kindness. They never won me in a family. I come from a bad home. I was trash in their mind. And so I just walked away from the party. I needed to be alone. And I went and sat outside in the wet grass. I looked up the stars and I just got lost in the stars. I just gave up. I surrendered. I was like, God, if they can't care about the nieces and nephews that I just lost, there's no way they're ever going to care about me. You know, I thought Catholics were supposed to care about babies. And then they're supposed to be loving people. And they had nothing for me or my babies. And so I just was looking up the sky and I just surrendered and let go of trying to get people to like me. I just let go. And all of a sudden, like this big screen opened up like the old um, drive-in theaters opened up in the sky and there was the drowning. I watched like I was in this vision. It just like took me over and I watched this whole drowning and everything happened front to back. And when it was over, I was like, it's jolt. Like, like, did I drown when I was little? So I went and asked my mom the next day because we didn't have phones back then in the eighties. And I said, um, not that <laughs> there wasn't been in phones. It's just like, it was like, we couldn't afford a phone back then. So I drove to my mom's in Marietta and I said, did I drown when I was little? I only had two questions. Did I drown? And how did you find me? Cause I don't remember that part. And she says, yeah, you did. And she said, she didn't want anybody to know about it. Cause she didn't want my dad to find out because her firstborn died they had actually six children and the first born died at nine months and they blamed her for it you would call it neglect today and um so she didn't want anybody known about it that's what was never talked about and she was like how do you remember that and i said i don't know i said i just followed i just come to me last night and i said how did you find me and at first she didn't remember she thought more about it she's i remember now she says when i noticed you weren't there i asked john Where's she at? I And then she said, go to where you saw her last. And you keep diving down there until you find her. And he eventually found my body down there. And he was carrying my dead body at the house. So that's that's my indies. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that, Peggy. Um, there were moments in your, in your accounts that I felt like crying, like they're really uh, profound and I really appreciate those are vulnerable moments that you're sharing. Um, I'm really sorry for all the pain that you went through. First of all, I'm so sorry for that. That's no child, no human should ever, ever go through that or ever not feel loved. And, uh, yeah, I just want to tell you that if no Thank one you. else tells you that I lo I love you, I know you you don't know me, but I'm telling you, <laughs> thank you, got you love from me, and um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so I I have a few questions. Some stuff you've kind of already answered in your account, but um, some things I haven't yet heard you speak so much about. So if you don't mind, um, the first thing you kind of said is that you 
at first you didn't have a physical body, except when you were a child and you di you died at the age of five, you said, um, mm -hmm. and you you refer to yourself as like playing and flying. Did you have a, t a body in that moment? Yes. Mm -hmm. You did. Okay. And um, well, okay. I take that back. I felt like I did. You look down and you see it, is, it wasn't there. No, just like oh, in the white light, look down and see it wasn't there. But, um, but yet that's a good question because, but yet when I'm standing there at the door knocking, I have a body. Wow. And they turn and see me. I see them and I'm sure they were ghosts, you know, they weren't real, you know, live people. Yeah. And so we all had bodies. I didn't think about that. And when I'm walking along the highway, talking to the boys, I feel like I have a body. And when I'm running around with the kids playing at yard, I feel like I have a body. I feel like I can see it in my memory, me doing this. So is it like a situation where it can shift kind of thing? So you can yeah, have it. I guess, I guess so. Because yeah. you, Maybe it's like, say, people, I've heard of people, like, say, lose their leg and their toe itches. Mm, Maybe, yeah. it, you know, it's like a phantom body. Yeah. Yeah. Because you still feel like it's there. But, you know, when I was hovering over the pond, no, I, my body wasn't there. But yet when I was at the house, it's like I could see myself standing there, mm. a little kid at that door. Mm. And when I'm talking to the boys, I see myself walking along with mm -hmm. them, you know, and then running around the yard. Like I see myself running there playing. That's a good mm -hmm. question. That's, I, that's funny how the memory is. Yeah. That yeah. It, it switches from. Mm -hmm. From to, one form to another. Yeah. Form. yeah. 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 That's really cool. That's interesting. And even in the white light, you know, I'm this invisible me, but yet I see a me, physical me across from me. Yeah. It, it made me think of like a mirror when you were describing it almost like you can, it's like you're staring at your body in the mirror or something like that. And then you mentioned that. Yeah. And then you mentioned that you inhabited it when you were standing in front of the panel at some point, right? That you kind of had a body at that moment. Yeah. When um, like there was this invisible me and then I seen this physical me, you know, supporting out all this stuff that felt like me too. Mm -hmm. But yes, but yeah, I'm always remembering it as seeing it, this body across. And then when I went to meet Jesus, it's like invisible. But when I join him, I could feel like there's a physical me. And we, yeah. and I'm not seeing a physical me, but mm -hmm. Jesus is physical. And I'm feeling like I am too. Interesting. Wow. That's cool. Um, the other question I have for you is uh, when, when you died, and you went over either the first time or the second time. I think you kind of mentioned a little bit, but are you still aware or can you see or fear, feel or hear the people who are still alive on earth? I'm sorry. What was the first part of that? When? Um, so when you die, are you able to see, hear or feel the people who are still alive on earth? My drowning NDE was all out of body. So I was right here on earth. So yeah, you know, I, even before I completely died when I'm choking and I'm at the ceiling and I see my mom and sister, you know, then back my body, then I'm up above. And then later when I look down and I see them on the bed sheet. Yeah. And I couldn't ever hear them physically. Now that I think about it, but I heard those boys mm -hmm. actually, actually, no, I didn't hear the boys. I was telepathically talking to them and not understand why they weren't hearing me. Mm -hmm. And then I realized it was telepathic, this me and this boy. Mm -hmm. So it's like, there's telepathic we can do. Cause I'm, I'm talking as experienced as a ghost right now. Right. 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 <laughs> so, um, for me and other people might near Indies might be different. I'm sure. But for me, I couldn't hear anything of this earth, any noises, the birds, the people talking. I felt emotions, but yet when I was telepathic talking to that boy, he started answering me hmm. like, you know, I'm thinking, you know, now as I'm older, was this his subconscious or something? 
And it makes me wonder how many times the spirit's talking to us and we don't realize. Yeah. Because you know, it just leaves you with so many questions yeah, to try absolutely. to understand. Yeah. And when you were in heaven, were you able to hear, see, or feel the earth or the people on earth? Not unless when we went down to the train Not that was on. Unless you yeah. physically go and visit the earth, is what you're saying. Yeah. Although before I saw the panel and I'm just alone in white light, I remember the smidgen of a thought that about that time I'd never been to York, New York City, but it was as if I was, it seemed like, like a street, like New York City. I was like on the sidewalk view and I always see these people's feet and the bottom of their legs and their briefcases and stuff. And they're just all so fast. And I'm thinking, I wanted to tell them, get out of the rat race. Stop focusing on the competition and the careers. Get out in nature, the woods, and enjoy life the way we're meant to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Like, this isn't what we're meant to be doing. Mm -hmm. I remember having that little smidgen thought. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually, I think as I get older, I was talking to somebody else about the exact same thing. As I, as I get older, the desire to get away from um, the busy kind of materialistic life gets stronger. And I sometimes wonder, is it because we're getting closer to death? Like, is that why as we get older, some of us now feel like we want to go back to nature and we want to have like a simpler lifestyle and just focus on our families and focus on our loved ones and stuff like that. So yeah, I think that's a, a really great point. The other thing is what was the most surprising part or revelation um, that you had either in your first or your second. I never thought I would go to heaven and tell God off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, I, I remember hearing you talk about that and I was like, oh, wow. And he, and he doesn't, he didn't get mad, right? Like he wasn't like all thunder and lightning. I mean, no, but you know, it was a firm voice that, yeah. you know, I wasn't the boss. He was, and I need mm -hmm. to calm down and straighten yeah. up and and it wasn't my personality at that time to be so spunky now mm -hmm. when i was younger as a kid i had a lot of sass and spunk and um and as a teenager i, was, I thought i was a rebel or a hippie even though i was in the 70s not the 60s and but um once i got pregnant at 18 become a mother i calmed way down mm -hmm. and was really trying to go by the rules of life and give them the mm -hmm. best life and and with my husband's family, I was always trying to be such a good girl because I was never good enough for him. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to be the good Catholic, the good, the good, good, good. And then years later, I realized I was the only one that was being good. <laughs> we were all beating on each other and doing all these mm -hmm. awful things. And, and so, but I was trying so hard to be good, to be accepted, not looking at their faults and their sins, only mm -hmm. mine. Yeah. That was exaggerated. Yeah. Wow. Um, and, and out of curiosity, what did God look like? All I seen was the bright white light. All mm. I seen was the very faint outlines. Mm. So he, he had like a figure, like a human figure. I saw, um, and it's strange because, um, if I see an outline here recently, the, it's like shaded in dark, but these were like a line outline, like a coloring book page where the mm. inside of it is white as well. So if you think, if you opened up a coloring book and you see the dark black lines, if you picture them so faint, they're barely there in a bright mm. white light, that's all I saw. Other mm. than Jesus, when I seen him from behind mm -hmm. and it was a thin man standing there with hair about like yours, a shoulder mm. length and, and just from behind, that's all. And then the feet which I'm not sure if I imagined that or just sensed I was at his feet. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. I guess it would be hard to even conceptualize like even like when you come back to have a, a clear concept of what God would have looked like um, from a human perspective, if that makes sense. When I um, got back in the wheelchair, I thought that this and my exact thoughts and my husband always laughs. When I say this, but I said, it's my exact thoughts is I thought this never happened to anyone in the history of the world. <laughs> that was my thoughts in my head at 25. Well, I never heard you know? a near, yeah, near death experience anything remotely like this. Mm -hmm. And it was shocking. 
but it was also gratitude that I was sent back to give me a little chance here to save my life. Of course, I didn't know then if I was going to live or die in the next hour or few hours. Mm -hmm. And so it was also, I was also terrified. Did you know? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Did I know? I was going to ask, did you know when you came back that you had just experienced the reality of death? Was that? Yes, very it weird? was in my face. The moment I was back, I was like, I was just in heaven accepting it. But now I'm back. Mm. And the nurse, I'm thinking she don't even know her patient just died because mm. she's talking to this other nurse. Like, she didn't know I just died. And the first thing that come back was my hearing. And then I felt my hands on the armrest. I was able then I contact my body mm-hmm. and something let me know. Once I felt my feet on my, on the pedals in the wheelchair, I was all the way back. And I sat there and waited a moment and then I felt my feet. I'm all the way back. It's like, I, it, it took a little, like a minute mm-hmm. to go back in. Wow. And it like went from my head down. And you, you mentioned um, like a panel or a council. And I was just wondering, just because the Bible talks about uh, around the throne of God, that there's actually um, a a council of 24 elders. So do you think that might be what you saw or something like that? If I had to count, which I can't, because it's just like this faint outline, I would, if I had somebody say, well, you got to guess, I would say five standing and five sitting in front. Mm, So a lot less than 24. Interesting. (laughs) And, uh, okay, cool. And the next question I have is, sorry, if you look, see me looking off to the side, I'm just looking at my questions. Uh, how would you say, I mean, you kind of mentioned this because you've had all these extra experiences when you come back. How would you say that these experiences have impacted your relationships and your life? Well, um, before I forget, I started to tell about something. I was like, oh, wait, I was on the Oh, wrong sorry. Place. And, um, I just want to realize I need to fill that in. Um, when I jump forward to when I was a counselor in 2010 and this great big guy's there and I recognize his name, like, did you go to those reunions? And, um, and so I, I mentioned this for the first time to him about the little boy drowned the ditch and he leaned way back in his chair, this great big man. And he's like, looked at me, he said, that was you? He said, that was my little brother. He swears to this day an angel saved him. Wow. He's like, I can't wait to tell mom that we now know who that was. And I would love to talk to his brother. I like to find him on Facebook and, yeah. and see, you know, what do you remember? You know, that yeah, was Yeah, you yeah. totally should. That would be an incredible conversation, right? Yeah. But, um, how it's changed my life is, I'm as I'm getting older, I'm 62 now, is I can connect the dots now. I can look back, all these memories that's like, God, I'm not ever talking about that. That's just weird. Why, why does that keep popping in my memory? That couldn't have happened. All that. I don't do that anymore. I accept myself and my memories as truth because one, I know I'm a truthful person and I have thought of every other possible explanation could be and nothing else adds up. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm connecting the dots and I can see how God worked in my life. And that's why I like to have my podcast because I feel like other people can watch and hear these other experiences and see God yes. because this is how he interacts. This is what death means. The first few moments is like, and we see God's um, grace, wisdom, compassion. I mean, I was screaming and yelling in his face, basically, even though I didn't see his face. And, and he sent me back and I have gratitude because a lot of women die to a pregnancy. They said it's the biggest tool of pregnancy the hospital ever saw. And, wow. you know, and I'm thinking I, I was, I was allowed to come back. Like, you know, I asked God this, you know, like even when Jeremy was drowning, you know, take, take, take my twins. Don't take my baby Jeremy a week later. I lost my twins. Um, so I had a lot of guilt. I didn't talk about that for them. And then, you know, with being sent back and, and then the miracles started happening after our, I lost the twins, things started happening. I didn't know the word into E. I didn't know after her facts of into ease, but things started happening that are now I realize are like classic of into ease. Yeah. You know, the, hearing the boy, dr- the little baby drowning and nobody else heard it. And this voice saying, go over there to the grass. And I'm realizing 
that these voices that come in and out through my life that I've dismissed, this, this was real. It's like yeah. the, like the angel that spoke to me in the drowning has popped in my life all throughout yeah. and give me these, these wisdoms. And um, I was a child abuse investigator and I just knew things. I could get confessions easily. Wow. And everybody was just at all. I was this tiny little thing. I always looked young for my age and I'm just like, you know, solving these cases and these big old cops are getting upset. Like, yeah, well, how did she get this confession? They wouldn't talk to me. How did she know this? And I was just, everybody was calling, asking for me and they wouldn't talk to any other worker. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know, but after the drowning, before I went to college, just to become an investigator. Um, like we were going down the road one day and all of a sudden I told my husband pull over. And I jumped out of the car and I knocked on this house. I didn't know who lived there. And this girl opened up that I happened to know. And I was like, what are you doing here? So I'm babysitting my sister. And she's been married to my brother. And I said, what are you doing here? And she's on babysitting my nephew. I said, take me to him right now. And I rushed or ran back there. And he was choking on Easter basket grass. And I, wow. saved I started pulling it out. And she's like, I wouldn't even know what to do. And, you know, she says this day, if you haven't been there, he died. And then, um, you know, there was that little boy in the ditch. And so when I got in the car, I told my ex, you know, what happened? He's, and we were looking at each other like, what's going on with me? We didn't have any explanation. Like, so you don't even discuss it because it, it makes no sense. Yeah. And then after that, um, I heard a slight scuff noise nobody heard. And I ran up the hill and there had been a car wreck. And it was perfectly quiet up there. Two guys had been ejected off the, the big hill and way down in the creek. Mm -hmm. And then the two up front, they were laying their heads on the dash. Their necks were broke. And we got the life flight there. You know, they died in route and revived them and, and stuff. And they ended up all being okay. But it's like, how did I hear that? Nobody else heard it. It was a slight scuff noise that I heard. And you, you wouldn't even pay attention to. Yeah. And and so, you know, things like that happened. And then when I was an investigator, I never thought that, oh, because I had an NDE, I have this extra insight. Not until... Decades later, did I start and learn about NDEs and after effects? And I thought, I wonder if that's why I just knew things as a investigator. Mm. Yeah. That, that, you know, one time I um, I knew this kid, there's something wrong. And I called the doctor. He was at the junior high. And and he's, oh, he's fine. It's just in her ear. And I was like, no, something's wrong. So I called the parents. And I'm like, I know the doctor says he's fine. He's back in school with a school note. But, you know, the guidance counselor is a little concerned. And I am too. And and I, I don't have any proof of anything. I just, and they said, say no more. They said, we had the same feeling now that you said it. And they rushed, took him to the hospital, had a brain aneurysm. Wow. Oh my goodness. So God is using you to kind of help all these people. That's incredible. And, and it's just, it's just been a strange thing. Yeah. And, and I try to deny it a lot. A lot of times I'll argue with it. Like, you need to get down that road if something's going on. I'm like, no, I don't want to. And I'm like, wait a minute, who am I arguing with? that's not me that's something else coming in yeah it's like the spirit the spirit the holy spirit is kind of moving you to to help all these people and do all this this amazing yeah. stuff that's incredible and i don't do readings or none of that you know what i mean like yeah, no. i can't i can't command anything you know to come mm -hmm. to me or know anything it, it does it on its own it comes out of the blue yeah when i at least expect anything yeah. And I feel like that's, that actually validates it more because you're not doing it for your own gain. So I feel like that definitely validates what you're doing because it's something that comes out of the blue, like you said, to help somebody else. So that's incredible. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you as well, kind of, this is kind of tied to a, li a little bit. How has this affected your, your spiritual life or your spiritual beliefs? I went from believing to knowing. Wow. That's powerful. So you're like convicted now. Is oh, awesome? definitely. That's yeah. awesome. Because, you know, when you're little and you go hear these things and you're a teenager and you're a grown woman or whatever, and you hear it and then you just don't know. And yeah. you don't know how it all works. You're just not sure. And then you have these experiences and you know you were there, you experienced something that, and I, and for when you have an experience, I think for a lot of people, we doubt ourselves. Like we think mm -hmm. that couldn't have just happened. 
And then yeah. you think, and it's like this battle in your mind, but you know it did. Like the moment they're doing the ultrasound and the nurse is doing the ultrasound before she calls the doctor. Um, my sister met me in the elevator and she's like, oh, I see the twins, Peggy, look, look. And I said, no, I'm dead. No, I, no, they're dead. And I, I know what happened the night before, you know, the, the, I was dead. And, and I feel like I'm just going to die any second here. Mm -hmm. and, and I still don't know why. And so I won't even look at the babies because I know they're dead. Like, why bond? And then I thought for a second, she was so excited to look at the screen. And I wanted to be excited. I wanted to have those babies, one in each arm in December, you know. And um, so I thought for a fleeting second, I thought, as I started turning my head to look, I thought, well, if last night was like, I'm crazy. Like if I'm now, like for some reason, like my mentally ill sister, I'm totally delusional then I would have my babies in December. And so which do I want, you know? And I thought, oh, I want my babies. Maybe, I, maybe that was wrong. And I thought, man, if that's wrong, crazy is powerful because that's so real. I know it was real. And just as I'm turning my head, it's like this dilemma. And I'm like, it doesn't matter what I see on that screen. I know I'm about dead. I know where I was last night. There is no way that was crazy. Nobody will ever convince me that that didn't happen. And then as soon as I turn my face over, she turns the screen where I can't see it. And she jumps up and her chair falls backwards. She runs to the phone on the post and she yells, Dr. White, stop. And she runs out of the room. Mm -hmm. So you got validation right in that moment too. Yeah. That what you I saw was real. Hand. Yeah. The doctor come in. That's when he says the worst thing imaginable. Wow. So, wow. That's crazy. I'm so sorry that you went through that. I can't imagine the pain of losing children. I, it's beyond comprehension. So I, I'm really sorry that you went through that. And I, I hope that you find comfort in knowing that there's a place that they're waiting for you. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And I love the NDEs that say they seen this room and there's these babies. And, yes. Know, I've actually heard that. <laughs> yes. I've heard that from multiple NDEers that there are children growing up in heaven. So that to me is very comforting. Um, but I, I wanted to kind of ask, in addition to these um, questions, you, do you still experience um, kind of like these prophetic moments, like even till, till today, like, or are these things that happened once and then they kind of died down as you get older or um, do you still experience them? They, I would say they died down, but also too, I think I was blocking a lot out denial. Um, a couple years ago, we uh, stopped and helped somebody with an accident that just went off the road and we stayed till the state to come and some other people were talking to him. And then we went on town Shepherd's Plains on our way back home. And I've never seen this where I've lived here since the seventies. And I've never seen this before in town. It had a sign. It says road close with this main highway goes through town. And um, I said, road closed due to accident. I said, I've never seen a sign like that before. And so my husband pulled over and hopped out and asked the cop standing there. He says, we just live down. You need to go that road. He's okay. He says, yeah, because the accident's further down. And as he's out there talking to him, I suddenly knew what happened. I knew it was a motorcycle wreck. And I knew there was a woman on the back that they don't even know about. She was falling off the funny. bike and they don't even know about it. And so my husband, I couldn't wait for him to go back to the car. And he come back. I said, was there a motorcycle accident? And he said, yeah. I said, do you know if there was one people or two? I said, because there was a woman on the back and they don't know about her. And I'm just like, D -d 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 -d. And he's like, well, he's ignoring me because this is, sounds stupid. You know, it sounds weird. And I was just like shaking. I just knew this. I had to go down there. And he's like, no, we're not allowed down there. So we got home and I called my friend that lived further down that road. I said, can you see the accident? And she said, yeah, the cops are right out in front of my house. And I said, I told her, I, I just know that, that they think it's just a man. I said, but I know there's a woman, she's been flown and they don't know it, thrown off. And she's, well, I don't know anything. So later at night in the paper, I wanted to go there so bad. I said, just let me go down there. And I thought the cops would be like, get out of here, it's a scene, you know. And so it's like this turmoil. And later that night, I kept checking the news, and it said that it was one guy that was, um, and he was deceased, and a drunk driver hit him with a truck. And I'm like, they, I know there's a woman. I know there's a woman. There's no, but they're not saying it, so maybe I'm crazy. And the next day, I see in the news that 
uh, guy had called and he says, I think my mom was on the back of that motorcycle with that guy. Wow. And they wow. went looking had been thrown and she was up in the woods and died. And so I will like for always feel guilty. Like did, you know, why didn't I go down there? I, I could have, you know, not said I'm here because I think there's a woman, you know, I could have just quietly just walked around and looked. Um, so I learned a big lesson on that, that mm -hmm. to not let anybody um, stop me when I'm feeling this. Wow. That's powerful. That's incredible. Well, hopefully you won't, you don't feel too much guilt about that because I feel that um, things happen for a reason. So in the newspaper, it said that she what, it was the anniversary of her other son's death. And oh, she wow. went to see his, his grave or something or where he was killed. I don't know, but they went somewhere because of the anniversary of his death. And I don't know if they're on their way there or on the way back. So I thought, well, maybe she wanted to be with him. Maybe she was having an NDE and she was with him. And as she's dying, and maybe she didn't want to come back. And yeah, but, possible. But, but I don't know. But you know, you feel like if you if you know something that you could act on it. Yeah, but that's incredible because your your knowing sense. Um, most most of us don't have that, or I don't. If we do, we don't we don't recognize it. Maybe so. So yeah, it's it's cool because you. I think you're super in tune to those kind of intuitions and like prophetic kind of, you know, senses. So I think that's incredible. And um, yeah, I just, uh, I don't, I don't want to take up too much of your time, Peggy, but I really appreciate you sharing these accounts and these experiences. And um, I, I, I don't even know what to say. Like, I'm just, like in awe kind of, <laughs> because yeah, because the experiences are incredible and I have two young children myself. So um, your, your stories really resonate with me. Um, I have a five-year-old little girl too. So when you were talking about your experience as a five-year-old and, and also the amount of insight that you had um, as a five-year-old child. And uh, I thought that was kind of incredible. And um, anyway. I find it strange that I can remember memories, my thoughts, yeah. You know, even before the drowning, I could, you know, the memory of me sitting there playing with that Barbie doll on the floor in my bedroom and seeing my mom walk in and that towel she threw over her shoulder, wiped the sweat on her neck. as she said, let's go swimming. You know, it's wow. like, like these memories, even like even before the NDE, you know, it's like this block, this is like embedded. And then the moment, you know, that I'm reading this um, nursery rhyme thing, you know, it's like, then there it ends. And it's just like, well, I can't remember what happened before that or, you know, after. after it's just like, it's, this is a block with this memory. That's just. Yeah. Like, That's incredible. Yeah. I have a terrible memory, <laughs> but I think it's all, it's incredible that you have these, like, like you said, like blocks of memory. And I think it's because they're so significant. Like they're so, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They, they're so important in your life. And, um, yeah, that, that's, that's really cool. And it's very comforting to know that, you know, we have children in heaven that we are able to, you know, I flying around also resonates with me a lot. Cause when I was young, I used to have constant dreams of flying all the time. And it was a difficult time in my life as well. So I don't, I was wondering if there's a connection there with the flying around and how last going few years stuff. I've had this repetitive dream, maybe a couple times a year. And it's so vivid and it's, it's different scenarios, but it's all me doing the same act is I am walking around a room and I get going. And I'm telling people, watch this. And I start spinning around and I start floating. Lifting the off. And I'm, I'm showing, I'm teaching people how to do it. I had a Just, very similar dream, whoa. very similar, but I wasn't running around the room. I was like spinning in place and I was like lifting off. Uh -huh. That's why yeah. I start running around the room and then I start spinning. And then, yeah, it was yeah. like, watch this. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> I wonder if there's a connection there, a spiritual connection with that. But um, anyways, but, okay. you know, that's why I decided to you know, start telling my story because when I realized I saved my son from drowning through mm -hmm. prayer. And yeah. I thought, if I can do that, I want every parent to know how to do this. Just like stop in your tracks and start praying and pray your heart out mm -hmm. and don't stop. You know, and then like a year ago, I was going down the road, not far from where that motorcycle accident was. And it was a beautiful Saturday, and um, 
there's nobody else on the road. I can see town in the distance. And all of a sudden I get this fear. I'm about to die. I'm like, this is stupid. What's this stupid fear for? There's nothing around. It's a beautiful day. And I'm like, but I have learned to listen to these feelings. Mm -hmm. So I just start praying, God, I don't know why I'm feeling so scared right now, but please protect me because I just feel like something's about to happen. And I see a black SUV coming towards me from town. It's a two lane road. And all of a sudden it pulls into my lane and it's darting straight right in front of me. Not like veered off, like fall asleep. Like it was deliberate and it's charging right towards me. And I've always had it embedded in my head. Like if you see an animal on the road, you don't swerve. You just get things head on because swerving is when people get hurt. And so I, I thought, I can't swerve. I can't swerve. This is going to hit me head on. I'm like, really? I'm dying right now on this beautiful Saturday. And I'm thinking, you know, the squads will be come cleaning up this mess. They're going to call my husband and my sons. And, and they're, you know, just like, how this, how, why is this cart? It's like, I feel like death wants me and death wants me right now. These are most wow. my exact thoughts. And I couldn't see the people in the SUV, even though they got, uh, must have been tinted windows. Cause even they got like almost to my car and are straight ahead. And I'm like, this is it. Like trying to brace myself. And then I see my wrist. Well, we heard say, well, you can turn a little bit. And I, I turned my wheel. I feel like something took over. I was like, we can turn a little bit and turn just slightly. And then this car is coming down my side in my lane. And I'm bracing myself. Like, oh, it's going to crunch. I'm probably going to at least get a broken arm or something out of this, you know. It's just going to sideswipe me so hard. And it goes right down my side. Nothing touches. Not a sound. Wow. I look on my rear view mirror and I see it pull over this lane. I'm like, is somebody out here trying to kill people on purpose? I had my husband call State Highway Patrol and report it. Like, is somebody trying to run people off the road? Here? Yeah, that's crazy. But and I had to pull over. I was just shaking. And, you know, I just think, you know, people need to realize that God is real and God Absolutely. does answer prayers. You know, like on the way to the hospital, I prayed, God, don't let me die right here. And I didn't wait till the hospital. And I did, I died in the hospital. And then that night in the hospital room, I prayed, just keep me alive till morning. Maybe the doctor will come in. And, and that happened. And then if, you know, so much in our life happens and we dismiss it, we don't understand it. It don't make sense. But if we really stop and give them the respect they deserve, you know, that I saved mm -hmm. my son through prayer, he could hear mm -hmm. me. And, yeah. you know, we just, my son and I just talked about this the other day. We haven't talked about it much. I went ahead and brought it up. And, and I said, does your dad remember that? Because we divorced after 16 years and I remarried. And so I don't talk to him. I never talked to him about it. And uh, he said, yeah. He says, dad said it was the weirdest thing. Wow. So, so is that what you would like the message you'd like people to know that prayer actually, actually yeah. works? Yeah. That's a powerful message because I think a lot of times, like we think of God as a genie sometimes. That's how I say it. Like we're like, okay, maybe if we rub him the right way, we get what we want. But what you're saying is that when we pray, things happen, right? We have to ask. Yeah. So much yeah. we want things, we want things, and we dwell, but we don't come out and ask. Mm. We have to ask. I mean, I asked to win the lottery, and it hasn't happened. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, when it's something that matters, yeah, I think mountains can be moved. Yeah, 100%. I think when it's like something that, that's right, like in accordance to what his plan is, then yeah, if for sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that's powerful. Thank you for sharing that, Peggy. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing your account and for sharing your time and your experience and your emotions and all this like really vulnerable stuff with me and with the channel. I really appreciate it. And um, that's how I repay God. You know, I feel gratitude. I got to raise my sons. Mm. You know, when you're dead and you think you cannot raise your little children, yeah. it's a horrifying. Yeah. And then to be back and like, I got to raise my sons. I get to be grandma. I'm great grandma now. <laughs> and it, everything is, you know, is just, I was given this plus the drowning, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I totally get that coming from a place of gratitude because you were given a chance to have that relationship and that experience of raising your children and grandchildren. That's amazing. <laughs> I, yes. I'm really young, but I still already kind of look forward to having grandchildren, even though my children are very little. But I also ask God for the same thing. I said, let me just, you know, see my kids grow up and then we can and then I can go home. You know, <laughs> when they get to be teenagers, remember, you have to go through this thing called <laughs> grandma <laughs> yeah i'm 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 title. dreading it but let's i'm dreading it but i know it's all part of the journey so yeah let's go um yeah but once you're a grandma it's like none of that matters just like after you give birth the labor none of it matters <laughs> yeah yeah totally i think we always focus on like the scary part like the labor or even death the, the pain of death right but all those things are just like a small moment first something that lasts for a long time afterward so, yeah yeah and i love that you know the indies like you're doing i have my channel that people realize hopefully they realize you know, someone's lost someone and and maybe say even murder or a horrible fire accident and people have got on these channels and been in those situations mm -hmm. and they didn't feel that mm -hmm. And in fact, I'm the only one that I know of, I mean, one other person I've heard of that even felt pain during drowning. I had people on my show come on, talk about their drowning and it didn't hurt. Like, what do yeah. you mean it didn't hurt? I'll never forget yeah. that thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just spoke with one uh, girl who she uh, committed suicide, but she said she didn't feel any pain. So I guess, yeah, it's just everybody has a different kind of experience, but um but yeah, because we dwell, you know, the living dwell. Oh, that must have been like this. And we create this scenario. Mm -hmm. How horrible it was that they you know, had this awful death and, and just life of guilt and not realizing. And even all the end of years, they're pulled out of their body. Say if they're in a train accident or a plane crash, or whatever, put out of their body before it even hits. Mm -hmm. They're spared. Yeah. And when I was 16, I was kidnapped and raped. And this guy was getting ready to approach me to rape me. And I was just tight. I was 16, but I looked like I was 12, a tiny little thing. And mm -hmm. I was praying to God, I wish I would own this earth. And then suddenly I was in the night sky among the stars looking down to earth. Wow. So and you had like an out of body experience during your I, traumatic experience. Yeah. I didn't have to experience any of that. I have no memory of it to this day of anything that happened. But when I come back, you know, I thought, he says, oh, I want a wife like you someday. And I thought, who must have been easy? I must have laid there like a corpse. <laughs> <then>, you know, <laughs> oh my gosh. There. And then also, too, I try to bring awareness to that because, you know, when we leave our body and we're not there, we can, when the police go to question us, we think, well, was it consensual? Well, I didn't fight. You know, I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. How do I tell them I was in the stars and and I wasn't there. How you can't, you don't have words. You don't want to say that. Mm. And so I, I think if people need to learn a lot about spirituality and different reasons. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, the fact that you're able to kind of dissociate from the trauma. Um, that's really, I feel like that's, I mean, if we all knew how to do that, I feel like life would be a lot, a little bit easier for some of us. I and mean, some people know, go through like, some real trauma. And you know, psychiatrists yeah. will say that's dissociation. Yeah. Like, no, it's God. Mm, We're pulling is. us out and rescuing us. You don't have to deal with that. Cause I think I would have committed suicide if I had memory of that because mm. I was such a fighter and I had fought off um, rape with two guys months prior. I screamed and screamed and neighbor heard and he come and, and saved me. And this, I couldn't fight because he mm. already threatened to dr drown me in this pond or this lake. He took me to, and they took me to the shed. There's tools all over the wall. And I was afraid if I, kept objecting to being there that maybe he would kill me with one of those tools. Yeah. And so I couldn't fight. And that went against everything that's in, I'm a fighter. I mean, I was in heaven fighting, you know, I'm a spunky thing <laughs> when it comes down to it. I can be really quiet and shy, but really push comes to shove, you know, that's where the will of wildflower comes. You yeah, know? absolutely. And I get that. I think a big part of like, you know, sexual assault and those kind of things is the, the feeling of like, something being taken away from you, like your will, your dignity, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, not being able to fight would suck would be really difficult. And um, Peggy, I know you have your own uh, channel and your channel is Peggy Robinson and DETV on YouTube. Is that correct? Yes. 
Okay, cool. I just wanted to um, shout it out and make sure I include that in the video and also a link to your book, um, okay. Will of a Wildflower. And I just want to, again, say thank you so much for sharing and for coming on and um, for everything that you've shared and you've opened your heart. And I appreciate that so much. Good luck on your channel. Thank you so much. And I hope that you have a great week. You too. Awesome. Thank you for listening. If you have had an NDE that you would like to share, please email us at travelsinthespirit at gmail.com. Until next time, God bless.